to redundancies here. So I want to start off by talking about just general account of perspectivism and um, just briefly mention um, some of the problems that I've uh, discussed with respect to perspectivism in some uh, previous work. And uh, then look at a uh, case of uh, uh, multi-scale modeling and see and argue or try to convince you at least why I think that's not a good case for perspectivism either. Um, and then if I have time, look at other instances of modeling that are non-perspectival. So the, the theme here is that um, the idea of incompatible or inconsistent models doesn't really provide us with reasons for being perspective. And then talk about um, what I see as a, a really a much better approach to perspectivism than what's been uh, discussed in the literature, and that's a paper by Michaela uh, that's coming out uh, out on, on her website now, but in philosophy and phenomenological research on perspectival realism, and I think that really encapsulates um, what's good about perspectivism, but I got a few small quibbles to make about that, so um, this is a good forum for maybe bringing those up and then uh, a few conclusions. Um, so the most common form of perspectivism that we all um, know and we're sort of uh, acquainted with in our philosophical education is really epistemic perspectivism, the idea that there's no view from nowhere, and um, that there's some cognitive epistemic perspective, sensory perspective, that we as human agents um, utilize when we engage with the world. And that has a long history from Kant, transcendental idealism is probably one of the most prominent forms, but it also finds expression in Nietzsche, and certainly also in Wittgenstein and the notion of language. Means. So for Kant, especially the only meaningful perspective is, is the world of human experience and how to um, very elaborate arguments to try to establish a form of realism uh, <clears throat> while still holding on to this kind of epistemic perspectivism. Now scientific perspectivism though makes a more um, a more narrowly uh, uh, is a more narrowly uh, defined view um, about how particular theories and models uh, interpret how should we, we should interpret the progress of science using particular kinds of theories and models. And there are some contemporary views about perspectivism in science. Um, Boss von Frassen in his book on, on representation says there is no representation other than the way things are used, taken, etc. So that's a form of perspectivism, but here he's focusing on representations. Now representations are by and large human constructs. Uh, so one might be willing to accept a kind of perspectivism in this context without thinking that truths about the world or that the world itself was perspectival in any kind of ontological way in the sense that uh, Anja alluded to. Um, Ron Geary is another uh, prominent advocate of perspectivism. Um, <clears throat> he introduces the topic in his book by talking about color vision and perspectival issues about color vision um, and then extends this to scientific observation by instruments um, and how instruments are sensitive only to particular kinds of inputs. Um, but then he also goes further than that and extends it to theoretical claims. Um, and I have some quotes here. Um, he says, knowledge we get comes from one perspective or another. Um, and implicit in, in Ron's view, I think, is the idea that it's the world according to a perspective that gives us knowledge. It's not the world itself, it's the, the perspective with which we look at the world. So, and this is also a quote from Ron, uh, the speed of light is a fundamental constant of nature relative to the perspectives in which it appears. So that is very reminiscent of a Kuhnian view. Um, also remarked that our uh, comment that Anjan had earlier on. Um, now perspectivism has been generally motivated in philosophy of science by attempts to try to understand this problem of contradictory or conflicting models. Um, and Ron explicitly <coughs> says it's an attempt to, to try to do this, but also to try to um, carve out a middle ground between constructivism and strong realism. So he says, laws of nature 
So just to give you a kind of familiarity with the view that Braun puts forward, because he's probably the most prominent advocate of this. He had a, a, an entire book devoted to the topic of perspectivism. He says, laws of nature should be understood as general principles that define a perspective, but make no general claims about the world. So the laws define a perspective. Models are constructed with the aids of principles and specific conditions, and in accordance with the perspective, make specific claims about specific parts of the world. Um, so then those models are tested against various instrumental perspectives, which are idealized versions of data that are produced by instruments. So it really is, I think, perspectives, perspectives all the way down here. It's a bit like the hierarchy of models view that we see in, uh, in Suppi's work. Here we see a kind of hierarchy of perspectives. We start with general laws, which define a perspective, then we've got the models, which are perspectives, models, test the models against, the, against uh, data, which are also perspectival. Um, so what we want to do then is reject the search for an absolute or complete model in favor of what Ron calls contingency and good fit. So representational models are designed then so that, the, so that elements of the model can be identified or coordinated with features of the world. So S uses X to, present, to represent R for purposes P. So we've got the user in here too. We don't just have the scientific context with the models and the instruments. We've also got the user. Um, so we've got lots of perspectives here that need to be accommodated. Um, so Ron thinks that this is a, a, a view of science that brings together observation and theory, perception and conception in a way that objective, objectivist account can. So we've got a kind of interconnected view here of what's going on in the corpus of scientific knowledge, where we don't have this sharp divide between, say, theory and data or models and data. We've got a kind of integrated holism. Um, so the question of fit between a model and the data um, is going to depend on the purposes for which the model is constructed and is user dependent. So there's a problem here though, of course, is how narrowly should we define the user? Because clearly we don't want to have a whole group of users all claiming different things about the same model. Um, this I think is very different from something being user dependent, or representation rather, being user dependent. Because we can talk about different sorts of representations, but when we're talking about the fit between the model and the world, um, it's not clear that we want, in fact, I think it's clear we don't want that to be highly contextual in a user-dependent sort of way. But Ron wants to, is very adamant in claiming that this kind of perspectivism that he's putting forward, and this is a quote from him, doesn't degenerate into silly relativism. So he has in mind something that's much stronger than um, a kind of contextual relativism that seems to be implicit in, in the view. So maybe Paul can defend this, um, why, why it is that this view doesn't engage with that kind of relativism in the way that it seems to. Um, so what about the world then in, in determining this notion of fit? Um, since we can only talk about the world from a particular perspective, that becomes a much stronger claim than epistemic perspectivism. So, and again, here I'm, I'm echoing a remark that Angie made. When we talk about epistemic perspectivism of the kind that Kant, for example, puts forward, we're talking about something that is, we all agree on, we all experience the world in the same way. So it's a kind of intersubjective accessibility that we have to the world. When we're talking about scientific perspectivism here, we're narrowing that down to a particular theory, which you or I may see very differently, a particular model, a particular experimental context. So we're getting away from this kind of larger epistemic perspective, and we're, in narrowing it down, I think creating many more problems. 
So how do we how do we get to the idea that um, the world is somehow has a has a, a role to play here, other than just multiple perspectives feeding into what we call the goodness of fit with respect to the model. Now, is the opponent, is, is the perspectival, uh, the perspectivist opponent here really um, a straw man? So the idea is that, well, look, you've got um, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the opponent of perspectivism must believe that there's only one way of looking at the world, that there's only one true model, that there's only one complete model. Um, but no one really believes that, I don't think. I mean, I don't think there's any realist that actually believes um, that there is only one correct model for a physical system. Um, so we use quantum mechanical models in some contexts, classical models in other contexts. But I don't think that makes us perspectivists. So how exactly can perspectivism, um, or how does it claim to solve the problem of interpreting the information about different kinds of models? How, if we're a perspectivist, can we make, does it help us to make sense of this use of different and conflicting and even contradictory models? Um, so I discussed uh, some of these models in some previous work. Uh, and uh, so I'm just going to very briefly mention it here and then uh, before I go on to talk about the multi-scale ones. Um, so the two different kinds of models that I, I mentioned uh, were um, turbulence models and models of the nucleus. And Andrew mentioned the, the uh, example of the nuclear models in his talk. But um, so in the case where we have um, uh, lots of different turbulence models for taking account of different sorts of flows, um, there's really two sort of generic kinds, um, mostly related to, to, to data fitting um, with respect to these flows. And there's about 50 different kinds of these models. Um, but really what the models are are just sets of relations and equations that help you to determine unknown turbulence correlations in, in different sorts of flows. Um, so the ability of the model to represent the flow in an accurate way um, depends on the, how complex the, the flow is. And so there's often really no objective features or objective uh, constraints that can determine the legitimacy or the accuracy of the model. It's really just uh, goodness of fit. Um, now, so the models are all constructed relative, relative to a problem context and usually chosen for their level of complexity or solvability. Um, they all incorporate different approaches for idealizing the fluid, um, but they don't embody different fundamental assumptions about the nature of the fluid. That is, um, there's no contradiction with the underlying structure of fluid mechanics. So they involve different, addressing different kinds of boundary conditions, different aspects of fluid flow, but there's no real sense in which these models are defining a perspective because the, the background perspective for these models is all fluid mechanics. The reason that there are so many models is that modeling turbulence is really hard. Turbulence is a very difficult phenomenon to try to get a, a, a theoretical handle on. So <clears throat> what ends up happening is that it, it results in mostly data fitting. Um, so we've got a lot of different models here that make lots of different idealizations, but they're not defining a particular perspective from which we're looking at the fluid. We're just using these for computational reasons. The nuclear case is slightly different because here again we've got over 30 different kinds of models, four sort of generic types. Um, but each of these um, is based on different fundamental assumptions about the nucleus. So the problem is modeling the nucleus um, in a way that allows us to be realists, if you want to say, about the nature of the atomic nucleus. If you look to these models, then each of them says something radically different 
about the nature of the atomic nucleus. Now, we all think that there's something real called the atomic nucleus. Um, so if you look to these models to try to give you information about what it might be like, you're just faced with a whole lot of completely contradictory accounts. So we don't want to be a perspectivist here either because we don't want to believe that the atomic nucleus has these different contradictory properties. As Anjan pointed out, that would be just incoherent. So being a perspectivist in this case doesn't help us either because it doesn't solve the problem of incoherency. So um, perspectivism doesn't really do any work in the turbulence case. It's not doing any work in this case. Um, if you say, well, no, we want to adopt some kind of perspectivism, because we want to say, OK, from the, the point of view of the liquid drop model, the nucleus looks like this. If, from the point of view of the shell model, the nucleus looks like this. And these are just different perspectives on the, on the same thing. Um, then what happens is we're um, believing a contradictory account. And so we needn't assume that there is only one complete and coherent model of the nucleus, but it also shouldn't follow that we want to accept contradictory accounts either. Um, so insofar as perspectivism seems to allow us in, uh, to believe in these kinds of contradictory accounts, then um, I think that it's, it, it's not a, a viable epistemic position from, with respect to solving the problem of these different kinds of models. So having different models for the same system um, isn't really evidence for, for perspectivism. It's really simply a methodological issue for modeling. Um, how, do we, how do we get it right? How do we <coughs> get a non-contradictory models? Um, now, you might want to say, well, look, the nucleus and turbulence models aren't really good cases because those are very difficult theoretical problems. Um, and so you shouldn't saddle the inability of perspectivism to come up with a coherent view on these um, as an argument against perspectivism. Um, so what I want to do now is look at um, some cases where um, it looks like perspectivism might have a role to play in, uh, in, in, in providing an interpretation of modeling. But in fact, um, it turns out that uh, it, it really doesn't do any work there either. Um, okay. So um, <clears throat> we just have a simple picture of modeling that goes on in, in engineering and physics and in various other sciences. Um, typically, what happens is some modeling focuses on scale. Uh, so you've got detailed uh, microphysical models that ignore the macro scale. Um, you just, it assumes they assume that the macro uh, processes are fairly homogeneous. You've got macro scale models, usually in engineering, um, continuum models that represent atomistic effects by certain sorts of constituents, constitutive relations. And this is the kind of case where uh, one thinks about perspectivism, I think, in, in, in sort of general terms. So you think, well, OK, we don't need quantum mechanics to build a bridge, so we've got, we focus on a particular perspective, a macro perspective, and then we, um, we build our models in, in accordance with a particular perspective. And so it's a different way of, uh, of looking at, at the world. Um, so the problem, though, is that when we're talking about these uh, constitutive uh, relations in macro processes, um, these are really, the constitutive relations are really uh, macroscopic representations of the way that micro constituents make up a system. So you're still bringing in the, the micro, micro uh, uh, processes here. Um, so what they do in these constitutive relations is they represent the effect of micro processes at the macro level. And these are things like equations of state, stress-strain relations for solids. Um, so you often model in engineering context, you often model those empirically. 
um, and just write down uh, linear uh, relations with uh, generalized forces and foxes, and then use symmetry properties to reduce the number of, of coefficients. So it's a fairly general process. So then you can measure the, the sort of uh, macro phenomena you're interested in, like viscosity coefficients or whatever. You just can uh, measure that empirically. So the constraints on the system become things like symmetry or invariance properties, second law of thermodynamics. But, and these are kind of perspective independent processes. They're not really uh, pers perspectival in the sense that they're general features that all uh, physical systems have to obey. But the problem with these models is that they're often inadequate due to co either complexity of the system um, or they lack the information of how exactly the microstructure affects the macro scale behavior. So there's not enough information in the, the constitu constitutive relations don't contain the proper sort of information. Or else there's just too many parameters that need to be fit. So there's no systematic way of developing that information that you need. Um, so you, these models can be accurate perhaps for very simple systems, but when things get complicated, then um, they really, they fail for so then you need to establish some kind of coherent micro uh, base. So the other extreme, of course, are micro models like quantum many body problems, uh, where you've got lots of complex mathematics, and here uh, the model just gives you far too much information, and there's no way of extracting what's, what's relevant. So you have macro models that are often uh, efficient but not accurate, and micro models that are accurate but don't give you uh, uh, the right sort of information so they're not computationally efficient. So the solution then becomes multi-scale modeling. So you've got a hierarchy of different models appropriate for the scale of interest, and the goal is to fit these um, models together in an informative way. So it looks then that, it looks like multi-scale modeling is the perfect example for perspectivalism. But really what happens with multi-scale modeling is you don't have an independence of the models on each scale. What you have in multi-scale modeling is a way, a, attempts to try to couple all of these models together into one coherent picture. So, in fact, it's the opposite of what one would think from the point of view of perspectivism. So you've got, here is a, a sort of, uh, just a diagrammatic um, picture of what a sort of multi-scale approach looks like, where you've got the, the length scale, and then length scales carved up by disciplines, where you've got physics on the bottom, chemistry, material sciences, and engineering. We often think about perspectivism as having these kinds of different, each discipline having a different kind of modeling procedure or modeling techniques. Um, and then we've got also modeling at different lens scales. So um, different, each, each of these different levels addresses a phenomenon over a specific window of, of lens and also time. So quantum mechanics, molecular dynamics, nano level, but the goal, again, the goal here is not to have different perspectives, but rather to couple them together in a coherent picture. So that's what you want to do with multi-scale modeling. It's not the separation of scales, but it's rather conjoining them together. So how to couple at the micro-macro interface when you've got micro-localized cases and you've got or micro-localized and macro everywhere else. Um, other cases where you need the micro everywhere and you want to couple the micro and macro just in the computational domain. Understanding how different complexities, co complex models can be related together and how you can combine them computationally to prevent um, serious artifacts in your uh, computational stability. Um, so, and there's different methods for doing this. Um, so the question then is, you know, how should we think about these different scales? How should we think about these different levels? Um, 
So the aim, then, is to, as I said, is to calculate material properties or system behavior on one level, but using information from other levels. So on each level, you have particular approaches for describing the system of interest. But that's very different from saying that you've got a model relative perspective that gives you an onto, that makes ontological claims about the fundamental nature of that level. So the, the, the goal here, the point here, is that these different levels represent different methodologies for modeling rather than different ontological accounts of the system over a, se a series of levels. So the goal again here is, is an overall theoretical coherence rather than a breakdown into different ontologies. So what looks like a classic instance of perspectivism, I think really isn't. That most of the modeling that's done from a, a perspective, if you want to call it that, is simply for calculational reasons or else for just simply ignoring things that aren't relevant. Um, but again, that's different from adopting a particular perspective with respect to interpreting the nature of the physical system. Um, <clears throat> How much time? That was late, so you have, uh, have about 20 minutes. 20 minutes left? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, so that was the um, multi-scale modeling. So now I want to just very briefly look at um, a couple of other instances of non-perspectival models. And um, one is, is uh, the Isaac model. And the reason I chose this is because the Isaac model is extremely pervasive <coughs> in all kinds of different uh, contexts. And, but yet, it's very difficult to get a sense that, of what kind of perspective the Ising model might be giving us. So it's used, um, it's, it's a initially concerned with the physics of phase transitions um, and how short range interactions can give rise to long range behavior, long range cooperative behavior. But the Ising model has applications in chemistry, uh, molecular biology, financial markets, um, it's a basis for uh, Schelling's uh, segregation model. It also has application in language change and also in the behavior of cancer cells. So it's used over a wide variety of different contexts, um, areas where we have cooperative behavior in large systems. Um, it does this because it can be formulated as a sort of mathematical problem uh, used to model generic structural features of cooperative behavior. So, um, but it doesn't provide us with a perspective in any kind of meaningful sense. Rather, it's just a very simple representation of interacting elements with finite number of possible states. Um, so it's really um, a case where you've got a large number of magnetic moments or spins that are linked together on a graph, and uh, they take sort of two values they can point up or down. Here we've got, and they either align themselves with their nearest neighbor or temperature will cause them to uh, rotate um, uh, randomly. But you can also use this for uh, the dynamic, dynamical updating rules of the IC model can describe a formation of decisions around of, uh, boundedly rational agents. So uh, discrete choice models, for example, you can use the IC model together with uh, statistical approaches from physics in social systems. So you consider elementary entities as the decision makers, um, and they've got to select one choice among different alternatives to vote for a particular candidate or to go to a university or whatever, um, buying and selling assets. And um, then you introduce the uh, concept of uh, random utility and the formulation of a, a sort of binary choice model here will, uh, of, of socially interacting agents, allows you to actually reproduce the Ising model 
um, that establishes connections between, and that establishes connections between these eyes and light systems and collective behavior, social decision makers. So you can use this model for a number of different um, purposes, representing um, the, the, the decision makers or representing the behavior of certain kinds of cells um, or what have you as Isaac-like systems. But here again, it's not, it's not giving you any kind of sort of perspective on the world. It's just uh, enabling you to, to represent certain kinds of behaviors in this particular way. Now, the final example of uh, uh, model uh, perspective independence that I want to look at is, or I just want to mention briefly, I don't want to uh, discuss too much about this, is a model independent searches for uh, new physics at, at the uh, LHC. And here this is an interesting idea because typically we think about, um, about particle physics as defining a particular perspective. And, but the recent uh, work at the, at the LHC looking for um, beyond the standard model, interesting uh, developments for being beyond the standard model physics uh, especially solutions to, uh, or attempts to, to account for dark matter and the hierarchy problem, involve what are called model independent searches or perspective independent searches. Um, so an example is uh, the hierarchy problem, why the weak force is 10 to the 23 uh, times stronger than gravity. Um, so the attempt to look at what the the foundations are, what the problem is with respect to the hierarchy problem, also with respect to dark matter. Um, two main uh, ways to, to look at or to try to uh, 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 develop um, some responses for BSM physics. One is direct searches, production and detection of particles, and there's been not much luck forthcoming with that after the, after the Higgs uh, search. But Secondly, are the, in, these indirect searches, searching for fingerprints of new physics using simplified models or model independent searches. So why model independent? Well, because what you, what you do here is use collider data from other sorts of searches, like supersymmetry searches, um, to try to recast that data in new ways. So data recasting then involves just reinterpreting selected data um, that were used for a specific kind of search, like a supersymmetry search, um, and recasting it into another kind of, of context. So you use a Monte Carlo simulation and a simplified detector emulation that converts the result of existing searches into, a new, uh, into new cases. So looking at the data from old searches to see what, what it'll turn up. But again here, there not, there's no use of a specific kind of model. It's just clearly looking at these, uh, this data in a kind of model independent way. Um, now, I had other stuff on that, but I'm not going to talk about it because I don't want to. Um, so, um, when I, I said at the beginning that um, perspectivism, one of the, the goals for perspectivism was trying to get us a better understanding of the use of contradictory and conflicting models, but also looking at how we should understand the role of the model in, in science and seeing whether or not models define a perspective, um, whether we can use perspectivism to make sense of the conflicting pictures that models give us. So what I've tried to do then so far is to show that it doesn't really help us with the conflicting or models, uh, that, that like the nuclear case or, or the turbulence case, and it also doesn't really help us in the more straightforward cases of multi-scale modeling and indeed other kinds of modeling that um, uh, modeling like the Eisen, using the Eisen model in a variety of different contexts and using these model independent searches um, don't really provide us with a kind of 
model-related perspective on, um, on, the, on phenomena either. So it doesn't really seem to have much force of motivation then when it comes to modeling and, and various methodological contexts. So what, what's next for perspectivism then? What's the other, uh, what, what other options are available? Um, well, perhaps a better role for perspectivism might be in interpreting theory change in the history of science or continuity of, of entities across theory change. So can it justify our claim, for example, that current perspectives are better um, in so far as we now have um, more inclusive theories, better explanatory, better predictive power? So maybe perspectivism can help us to make sense of that um, if, it, if it can't uh, provide us with a, a, a sort of epistemic foundation for modeling. So perspectivism then seems to be making two claims. It, it claiming that it accounts for um, practice, that it makes sense of practice, but it's also a normative position related to our epistemic attitudes. So we need to be perspectivist in order to make sense of, of, the, of scientific practice. Um, so the question then becomes, what grounds the normative justification? And does it really account for epistemic attitudes of scientists, or does it, in fact, provide us with some kind of normative epistemology? Um, and so, how do we? The second question: How do we appeal to the world if our knowledge of it is constrained by perspectivism? And indeed, should we appeal to the world? Is the perspectivist really um, sort of blocked from appealing to uh, the world in any kind of non-perspective way? non-perspectival So I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think that the, uh, a really much fuller and richer account of perspectivism uh, is the one that we put forward by Kayla in a paper, uh, just the recent paper. Um, I don't know, I can't remember the title. Four Kinds of Perspectival Truths. Four, four Kinds of Perspectival Truths in Phenomenology, in phenom phenom Philosophy and Phenomenology. So, um, two claims uh, that she makes in this paper is one, truth is ontologically grounded in worldly states of affairs. Two, the worldly states of affairs that act as ontological grounds for scientific knowledge claims are inherent in, scientific, in a scientific perspective. So, correct me if I get any of this wrong. So. <laughs> I wouldn't endorse the second one, but no, you go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> 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 just stop here. <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, so this one, perspectival truth is not indexed yes, to a yeah, yes, it's not indexed to a scientific perspective. Okay. So the idea here is that perspectival truth is still the realist truth. Um, it tracks perspective independent states of affairs, yet it's perspectival because it meets contextual truth conditions, which are standards of performance adequacy laid out by any given scientific perspective. So you've got perspectival, uh, or you've got truth that's not indexed to a particular perspective, but um, the contextual truth conditions, the performance conditions, are laid out within a perspective. Now, it, it sort of goes on from there. So meeting the standards pertinent to a given scientific perspective may be compatible with tracking perspective independent states of affairs. So you've got perspectival conditions that are set out, but those conditions are also compatible with some perspective independent or trans-perspective account of performance adequacy. So you have truth across the diachronic perspectives, tune like truth, this sort of progress of science, um, and across synchronic or model-based scientific perspectives. So, and the example here that she gives is claims about electron spin, despite significant perspectival changes, are still believed to be true because spin continues to perform adequately with respect to certain standards 
of performance adequacy that it was meant to satisfy. So it's also consistent with other scientific, accept, scientifically accepted theories. It can be deduced, deduced from the Dirac electron theory, um, and it's accurate in fitting current available experiment, experimental data about particle classifications. So truth conditions defined by perspectival standards of performance adequacy must also be evaluated from the point of view of other scientific perspectives. That's what we want, right? We want to be able to do this. We don't want to be locked in the perspective. So each scientific perspective then functions as both a context for use, for its own knowledge claims, but also as a context of assessment for evaluating the ongoing performance adequacy of knowledge claims of other scientific perspectives. So um, the quiet context of use, the perspective lays out the truth conditions intended as standards of performance adequacy, but quiet context of assessment, uh, the perspective offers standpoints from which knowledge claims from other perspectives can be evaluated. So correspondence with perspective independent state of affairs that allow us to evaluate the ongoing performance of our scientific knowledge claims across time because we simply do not possess a God's eye view to do that otherwise. So, I completely agree that there may be, not, there may be no God's eye view. Um, and that's the issue for epistemic perspectivism. Um, but the question then is, how do we incorporate the, the no God's eye view as the epistemic perspectivism into, is that a reason then to make us scientific perspectivists? So can we separate the no God's eye view of epistemic perspectivism from scientific perspectivism? So the question is then, what allows the perspectivists to appeal to perspective independent states of affairs as opposed to just comparisons among different perspectives? Now, doesn't that appeal to a perspective independent state of affairs constitute realism? And then the argument becomes a kind of truth tracking. Um, so we can track through, through these different perspectives, but really what's doing all the normative work for us is this um, independent, non-perspectival state of affairs. So we've got a strong form of realism here. We've got perspectival realism, um, which, I mean, I think, I mean, I agree with this view. I think it's a nice view. The question is, is the perspectivist going to be happy with this view? So I think the realist is happy with this view because the realist has the independent states of affairs. Um, the realist is having her cake and eat it too, dear, because we can make sense of all of these different perspectives. Um, the diachronic case um, is no problem on this view. Um, but I think if you're a perspectivist, you're going to have problems because the perspectivalist seems to be faced with a dilemma here, the, the real perspectivalist. If we accept perspectivism in the way that, that Long formulates it, um, we seem forced into a kind of contextualism or instrumentalism. If we appeal to a perspectival independent reality to justify our perspectivist claims, then we're forced to a kind of realism that the perspectivist was that perspectivism was designed to combat. Okay, the perspectivist doesn't want to be that kind of realist. Um, so it seems like the perspectivists can't really occupy the middle ground. Um, so I think there's a, there's a problem. Um, now, there's a problem for perspectivists, for a perspectivist, but I don't think there's a problem for the realist here. So just to wrap up then, um, I think that when we say that perspectivism doesn't really help us as a way of interpreting models or modeling practices. Um, the, uh, the cases that we looked at, what looked like perspective 
uh, fodder for perspectivism are, are really attempts to combine different kinds of models in the multi-scale approach, um, or the models simply provide no real perspective that can function in, in a substantive way. Um, so that leaves us then with the fear of change or stability of entities as a motivation for perspectivism. I think that's very promising, but only if one appeals to certain perspective independent standards of evaluation. But that seems to require realism about a perspective independent world, but that brings, I should say us, that brings the perspectivist right back to where he or she started from, which is an attempt to try to escape realism. Thank you.